All right, well, let's just go to the Lord in prayer. Let's just stand again and uh, go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we're so grateful. Grateful to you, grateful for who you are. Grateful for your presence, Lamb of God. Grateful that we can be to you a bride, a people, a body, a house, the church. We thank you for your people across the nations, all nations. We thank you. Lord, in this time, you are bringing out a people to yourself. We thank you that even now in the spirit, we can hear you summonsing our hearts, calling to us, beckoning to your bride. As in the Song of Songs, come with me. Lord, we come tonight. We present ourselves to become one with you in this time, Lord. I would ask Holy Spirit tonight for you to be the spirit of revelation that you are, to reveal the Lamb of God, the Son of God, the I Am of God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, the Word of God himself. We ask Holy Spirit that you would unveil him in our inward man, that we would see and behold and unto transformation the Lamb of God. We ask for that. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. You can be seated. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Amen. Thank you, Ryan. All right. Well, let's start out tonight. Um, um, I've been really asking the Lord to help me to narrow to narrow down, um, and I'm not sure I'm there as far as narrowing down what it is He wants me to share, but. Uh, I want us to start with a few passages of Scripture tonight. We're going to start in the book of Ephesians, firstly, and then move forward. <clears throat> are you guys cool enough, or are you good? The book of Ephesians, chapter 3. Let's begin with verse number one. We'll read uh, a fairly large fragment of this uh, chapter here. Uh, Chapter three, verse number one. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for the sake of you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to me for you, that by revelation there was made known to me the mystery, as I wrote before in brief, And by referring to this, when you read, you can understand my insight into the mystery of Christ, which in other generations was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed to his holy apostles and prophets in the spirit. That's quite the statement. It's hard for me just to read that without commenting, but let's continue on in verse 6. To be specific that the Gentiles are fellow heirs and fellow members of the body and fellow partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace which was given to me according to the working of his power to me the very least of all saints This grace was given. It's an amazing statement there in verse 8. To me, the very least of all saints. As Paul was the least of all saints, I don't know where that leaves me. I've been in the realm of the least in heaven. There's an entire realm called that. 
met some people. A lot of people came up to me, spoke to me. Anyway, to me, the very least of all the saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to bring to light, just underline that in your hearts, verse 9, and to bring to light what is the administration of the mystery which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things. Let's read, let's read that verse a second time. This book, uh, before I do, this book is not of this earth. I mean, I don't mean that in a sense that, well, it was written here. I mean in this sense. This is a book of revelation. Not the book of revelation, but a book of the revelation of a person. The Lord Jesus Christ himself. When you read the book of Ephesians, it's unlike any other book in the New Testament in that sense. It is Paul unveiling and revealing the Son of God but not simply in time. There are obviously here are statements concerning uh, what we would call time. But Paul, and I believe this was only a small component of what the Holy Spirit had revealed to Paul. There's no way Paul could put uh, all that was revealed to him in one singular book called the book of Ephesians. At least we call it the book of Ephesians. But nevertheless, Paul reveals specifically here what is true of the Son of God in eternity, what has forever been the heart of God, particularly in purpose. The book of Ephesians is focused upon the heavenlies, not just what's upon the earth. The book is heavenly in its focus. It is the eternal purpose of which Paul mentioned several times in this book, and we'll read one of those times here in a moment. But So we have to understand when we're looking at the book of Ephesians, something that would be very difficult perhaps for us to hear for a moment. Paul is standing on ground that has no history. He is speaking things that have never been spoken. I just want the weight of that to hit our hearts. He is not bringing up an echo from the past. He is speaking what no one else has ever spoken. Now, if we take that uh, in a way that is, well, or whatever, no, 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 no. That is a weighty matter indeed, and you be had better know that the Holy Spirit is inspiring you not only to write, but in what he has heard. This was not received by him in just one simple encounter. And believe me, brothers and sisters, he did not derive the book of Ephesians from the Old Testament. He derived it from the Holy Spirit. I just want to say that again. This book... It's not something Paul simply saying, well, um, let me interpret, and he does that in a number of his books. Let me interpret the Old Testament scriptures rightly in accordance with the person that those scriptures are speaking to. You guys know that. The books of the Bible are not pointing to things. They're pointing to a person. Amen? Amen? Jesus said that himself. You search the scriptures because you think life is in these scriptures. So as he says to the Jewish nation, you search these 39 books that were given to you, the Torah, the five books of the Old Testament given by God through Moses. You search these other books that have been given. You think life is in these scriptures. These scriptures speak of me. They testify of me. You'll notice in the book of Revelation, chapter 19, they're written on him is the word of God. That is his name. Now there are the scriptures, and then there's the word of God. And the word of God is not the scriptures. The word of God is a person. He is the lamb of God. <laughs> Amen. 
Well, my point is this. Paul's not standing on familiar ground. Have you ever stood on unfamiliar ground and had to speak something like Paul's speaking here that no one else is saying, no one else has heard? Well, that's where Paul's standing. I just want to bring that out. It's incredibly, incredibly important that we understand that truth in this book. That's why he refers over and over again to, by revelation there was made known to me the mystery that has been hidden in past generations. So he's very specific. He's as much as he can be, and, you know, whenever you're going to say something of this measure, uh, this is typical human nature, opinions and anger, and everything's going to fly. But, listen, brothers and sisters, so, sooner or later, each one of us will have to go on this journey of, uh, is it the fear of God or the fear of man that we're going to live and operate under? And uh, I choose, as we all should choose, I choose, as I would say you would choose, to operate in the fear of God more than the fear of man. Amen. God would have us to operate in a fear of him. Our orders are from the Lord, not from man. Our directions are from the Lord. I'm not saying that to say we're independent. We're not independent at all. We are completely dependent upon the Lord. That is absolutely true. And furthermore, we should be, and I don't mean this codependent, but I mean this in this sense, if we would be the body that he has called us to be, and, and I don't, uh, this is going to sound harsh, but I'm looking at the whole of what's called the church out there, and I just have to say to you, what's called the church isn't the church. It is the church in name only. It's not the church as he purposed. That's a general statement. It is not specific. I am definitely not saying here that there's, well, none of us. That's not what I'm saying. I'm being... I'm making a distinction here. Let me clarify. I'm making this distinction between an organization and the organism of the church. That it is the church because the life of Christ is within it. Not because it has a name and not because it has an IRS number, not because it has any of that nonsense. It never was, never will be the church. Or whatever. You get my point in that. Well, Paul's standing on completely unfamiliar ground. He's speaking of the eternals. He's speaking of that which you can't, let's just say this to our Western culture, Greek mindsets right now. You can't get this into your computer and figure it out. It cannot be understood that way. It is spiritually discerned. And that's the only way it can be understood. By the spirit of Christ in our spirit, giving us, granting us revelational understanding. Amen. It is actually true when we even read the scriptures. You'll never understand the scriptures with your natural mind. We are way too coming at this from here. Would you agree with that? It's not meant to be harsh. It's, like, it's much of our culture. Nashville's called the Athens of the South. That's not a good thing. The Parthenons and Centennial Park there, and an exact replica of the ancient temple in Athens. That's not a good thing. <clears throat> no, we're not going to be able to come to the revelation of Christ with mental assent. It's not brain power. It's not your IQ at work there. God will bypass your brain. We need our brains. They're great for mathematics. They're terrible for the spirit. In the solical realm, the brain is needed. But in the spirit, God who is a spirit comes spirit to spirit. If Christ be in us. And if Christ is not in us, and most people who don't have the Lord in them don't understand the scriptures at all, or their understanding is so skewed and 
They misunderstand. You cannot understand spiritual things by natural ability. They are spiritually discerned, spiritually revealed. Isn't that right, Mike? There's no other way around this. I can't tell you the numbers of sermons I preach from right here. To my shame, I say that to you. It may get us clapping. It may do all of that stuff for brothers and sisters. Fruit is not in a mental ascent to information. We need the revelation of the person. And that is a work of the Spirit of Christ within us. And this is just basic, but what we're about to talk about, it's key. That's why I'm saying this. It's key that we understand. What, what I want to share with us tonight, it is key that we understand by revelation, by revelation, and revelation alone. Can we understand? That's not some elite thing. All I'm saying to us is if the spirit of Christ is in us, then it's he that will reveal. It's he that will unveil. If I wrestle with him in that issue, if I assert my will, he'll give in to it. Let us have our way in that. Or we can yield to him, humbly ask that I might see, that I might understand, that I might know not information, but the person whom you would reveal to me. The heart is what's the matter in the church. And God always goes after the heart. He's not shooting for here. He's coming right here. And the heart should be better said, our spirit. All right, so verse 9 again. And to bring to light... Paul's intention in using what, what is here in the English is light is to say, I'm bringing forth revelation. I'm bringing forth revelation about the administration of the mystery. Now, he's already told us here earlier in chapter 3 that mystery is the person himself, and, as we will see, his purpose. It's important that we understand the two aspects, one in the eternal heart and mind of God, but two specific aspects of what Paul wants us to see, wants us to understand in this. Chapter 3, verse 9, let's finish it. What is the administration of the mystery, which for ages has been hidden in God who created all things? Verse 10, in order that, so here's further explanation, that the manifold wisdom of God might now be made known through the church. That, I just want to pause here for a second. That is an incredible thought. that the eternal mind of God could actually be revealed through a created vessel. But God is showing intent, his own intent and purpose. Through the church and to who? To rulers, to authorities, in the heavens. So Paul's not just simply saying that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God is going to be made known on the earth. Is that true? Well, yes, that's true. But I told you, as I said before, he's in the heavenlies in this book. And he's seeing beyond just this globe. And he's seeing the vastness of the creation of God. The vastness of who he is. I've been in heaven on numerous occasions. There are beings there that we have no language for. There are beings there that angel is not what they are. Seraphim is not what they are. 
Cherubim is not what they are. Living beings is not what they are. I didn't have any language for them. And in that moment, I didn't really care about language. I just have to say this to us, brothers and sisters. I hope we understand this. Everything written here is brought down into finite languages. And do we really believe that finite languages can properly convey the one who is everlasting? Is there, if a language can fully convey God, then the language is actually greater than God himself. It is an impossibility. I just want us to understand that. Does that mean, well, we can't trust what? No, I'm not saying we can't trust what we're reading. What I'm trying to say to us is that best, what we're going to get from the scriptures is our foot inside the door. But there's the difference and a distinction between my foot inside the door, let's put it in biblical language, coming out of Egypt and living in Canaan to the point that I know Canaan. Coming out of Egypt is not the same. That's salvation coming out of Egypt. That's not the same as living in Canaan. So, in order that the, verse 10 again, the manifold wisdom of God might now be made, it begins now, may be made known through the church to the rulers and the authorities and the heavenlies. Verse 11, this was in accordance with the eternal purpose which he carried out in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and confident access through faith in him. And then one other passage of scripture, I'm just, uh, there's so many, but I just want to hit this one uh, quickly here in Colossians chapter 1. Verse number nine, for this reason also, since the day we heard of it, we have not ceased to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Now, let me tell you what he's not saying there. He is not asking for God's people that they would understand what job they need. That's not what he's asking. It's not that that's not important. That's just not what he's saying here. The will of God of which Paul is speaking here is the eternal purpose. That is his prayer. He says that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will. I love that, don't you? You see, some of us are afraid of the will of God. Some of us are afraid of eternal purpose. So that's, let's get back to salvation. I'm familiar with salvation. So I'm trying, I'm trying really to be kind. I'm not trying to be unkind. I love the fact that he is my savior. Jesus means that. We should know him as that. And that is his name, as savior. But he has another name. And it's by far... A more eternal name. What do I mean by that? Listen. Anointed one. Anointed one is a missional statement by God as to purpose. It is a mission anointing to accomplish salvation for a people. But there was a purpose before there was a need for salvation. And if there was not a purpose before there was salvation then salvation itself would not have been needed. He would have destroyed us. We are redeemed and back into a purpose. If we see the purpose. And Paul's praying that for the church then. It should be our prayer now. Wouldn't you agree? Shouldn't our prayer now be not just the fact that we're saved? And I have to make a comment here. I love the fact of salvation. 
the love that is in salvation. We have yet to discern the height and depth and width and breadth of that love, salvific love. The salvific order of things have yet to be fully explored. If we put it that in the context of a land, we have yet to explore the fullness of that land. But I'm here to tell you tonight that God's purpose for mankind was not to save him. If God's purpose for mankind was to save him, then God would have to trip man up so that he would fall so that he could be saved. God's purpose for mankind was not firstly salvific. Salvific purpose came forth because man fall. Listen, I'm going to say something a little bit out there. Eternal purpose does not deal with salvation at all. In the truest sense of it. The necessity of salvation is to get us back to original purpose. We have to see that. We'll we'll go to the scriptures here in a moment. There's a lot of scriptures, more scriptures than we can read tonight, unless you want to be here till tomorrow morning. Because the Bible's filled with it once you see it, but we have to see it. That's the issue. We're going to have to see it in the heavenlies, and then the scriptures will testify. How many know that's really how it works? The Lord reveals himself, and then you find it in the scriptures. (laughs) <laughs> seldom is it the reverse. When you, even when you're reading the scriptures, as I love to do, when I love the scriptures, I love to read the scriptures. I love it. Here's what happens. When the Holy Spirit breaks into my reading of the scriptures and studying of the scriptures and said, pop, you could have had a V8. <laughs> Look at that, son. Did you see that? Well, No. How many know what that feels like on a regular basis that happens? It is the way. This is what the Lord said to me. I remember, you don't mind me saying this. I'm going to say it anyway. You know, it's just, I don't really care. Some years ago, 2000, whatever it was, I'll jump on this. uh, And I'm not going to tell you the whole thing. It it would just take too long and be way too weird. But um, I was, (laughs) I was in this experience and, And uh, standing on this suspended uh, 40-foot-long black stone, and uh, this scroll appeared in front of me and just unfurled right in front of me. And written on the scroll were 14 things that God has wrong with modern theology. Number one, theology is what man says about God, not what God says about himself. Number two, Unspiritual men and women are trying to, attempting to interpret spiritual scriptures. Just wanted to say those two. There's 12 others. And I remember in that experience as I was standing there, the Lord was standing to my right um, to, to emphasize this point of my uh, inability to understand even him in the scriptures. Emphasize the point of my inability to understand who he is. I want to just say this to us first before I tell you. Unless God reveals himself to us, you cannot know him. Do we really believe that any finite being can understand he who dwells in unapproachable light? It's an impossibility. He must reveal himself. The wonderful news is that he loves to reveal himself. (laughs) You don't have to twist his arm. Just give him an opportunity. You know, if he was a different kind of God, and he's not, if he had a different nature about him, there's like, I don't need you. Well, that's not who he is. No, he wants us to know him. Anyway, so I'm, I'm standing here on this black stone and I'm, I see this massive comet that is coming across the universe, our universe. 
the tell of it just goes into the unendingness of the universe. And then I pull back out of myself and see myself standing there with my little arms trying to reach up and grasp this massive comet. And so the Lord, as I'm watching myself, thinking, I'm thinking to myself as I'm looking at myself how stupid this looks. And so the Lord speaks to me and he says, that's the problem with you humans. He said, what you don't understand and what you can't grasp, you won't believe. And then he got really close with eyes that only he has. And he says, how can you believe and understand and grasp what comes out of eternity? It must be revealed to you. <laughs> I, I kind of caught the gist. <laughs> when he said, there's a whole lot more to the experience than that, but I'm not going to tell you about, you know, the other times when you slapped me. And, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> the other things. But listen, Paul's prayer for the church is a heavenly prayer in that sense. It is to get the church out of its carnal, I'm not talking about sin now, carnal mindedness of attempting to understand him through human filters and human mindsets and human grids outside of the spirit, the pedagogue of God who's been placed inside of us to reveal the person of Christ. The child trainer, the pedagogue, the Holy Spirit. That's his name, pedagogue, child trainer. He is in us to bring us forth in that place of seeing and hearing and knowing the Lord. It is not simply a matter of, of mental apprehension or comprehension. It is a matter of revelation. It is experiential knowing of the Lord who, as believers, now lives within us. Anyway, that's part of Paul's prayer. He's always pushing. You'll notice, notice this about the apostles and the prophets. of that. They're always pushing the people of God forward. There's no place of pulling over and parking and taking a rest in this, folks. He must become our rest. He's the day of rest for us. I'm not talking about works. If you think I'm talking about works, you're totally misreading what I'm saying. I'm talking about what is true living relationship with the living one who is within us. You won't have to worry about works when he's living in and through us. He will do the works through us if we'll be the vessels. There's no need to do works for him. The objective is never working for God. The objective is God working through us. Amen. There's a incredible distinction. Me for God will just get me in trouble, but God through us will bring us into his very purpose. It will cause us to be aligned with what he is doing. They asked Jesus that. Teach us to do the works of God. This is the work of God. Believe on me whom he has sent. Yes. Now that's the kind of work I want to be involved in. So, all right, well, let's go on. <clears throat> Verse 10, so that you may walk in a manner worthy. Notice how Paul couples walking in a manner worthy here with the revealing of the eternal will of God. I want us just for a second to, to think about this. Why, is, why would he bring this up? Because it is very possible, I'm, I'm downplaying this, to be so busy with a part that we think is so incredibly important and miss the whole. We can think that that part is everything but instead, it is only a component. And this is very true when it comes to understanding the eternal purpose of God. For some, evangelism is everything. People need to get saved. They need to get saved. They're not getting saved. They need to get saved. I'm, well, do we want people to 
Uh, not, not that I like that language, get saved. Well, what exactly do we mean by that? Is that going down front and praying a prayer? Is that just a fact that, God, I'm sorry for your sins? Or is that an encounter with a living Christ inwardly within us to the point that we are born again and become a new creation that had priorly not been in existence? One is transformational. The other is an act. I'm not, again, I'm not trying to judge things. I'm trying to bring things into perspective here. What happens when we miss the whole and see only a part? There is one, I'm going to jump right into this. There is one overriding purpose, one, singular, in God's plan with humanity. And it is not salvation. Now that bears repeating. I can see that it went down like a rat sandwich. So a double portion may be what we need. I'm not in any way downplaying man's need for salvation. Need for salvation is absolutely true for all of mankind. But Here is what I'm moving us toward, but we can be saved and never come into the purpose for which humanity was first created. And much of the church, if I could draw it out, I should have let let you keep that. If I could draw it out, if we could picture this, the, the eternal purpose here, salvation since man's fall here, Salvation is only the way back to original intent. And the church has been guilty, 90-something percent of the church, of preaching the way back without ever grasping and understanding by revelation the purpose. So we have a whole generation now of those who have maybe been born again but who are asking the question, what's next? And I said this way, Larry, and we're giving them our stupid answer. I just said about myself, uh, you just need to get saved. But that's not their question. Their question is a good question that God himself has locked up within the heart of humanity. Eternity is in the heart of man. What is this all about? Why are we here? The Lord really wants to answer that question. It actually is in the scriptures. More importantly, it's in the heart of God to reveal that to us using the scriptures, but that's not the only thing he uses. We know that. The Holy Spirit within us, if the ministries given to the church are operating according to his desire, that's another part of our training, is it not? It's meant to be. I'm not just talking about fivefold. I'm talking about elders, bishops, deacons. Those aren't positions. Those are functions. So Paul is saying, yes, that we may walk in a manner worthy of the Lord to please him in all respects. It is so, I can say this from past experience. When I'm walking outside of seeing what is the eternal purpose, things quickly become an end to themselves. And how many could say this to me? You don't have to say this with me, but how many can say, well, we get into it and we're excited for it for a little while, but like all things, it plays out, whether that lasts for two years or three years or whatever, and then we're bored again. How many wouldn't mind raising their hands and saying, well, man, that's been me at least some part of my life. That's been true of me. Because I've thought, well, this is the thing. It's never a thing. It's a relationship with a person who has a purpose for the creation of humanity that is not limited to this 8,000 years on this earth. I have to emphasize that to us. If we believe that the full purpose of God, eternal purpose, can be reached and satisfied in 8,000 years, we are mistaken. Or whatever the time of man is going to be here. We're mistaken. 
So do we want people to come to know the Lord? I like that language way better. To go down that journey to know him, to be in love with him, to encounter his love that draws us into a living, loving relationship with him? Absolutely we do. But if the body of Christ is functioning as the body it's meant to be, in teaching, in training, the equipping, Ephesians chapter 4, the ministry gifts are given. Why? For the equipping of the saints. Until, listen to this, to the full measure of the stature that belongs to Christ. There's this distinction between getting our foot in the door and entering in with him to his purpose. And I'll try to bring that out as we go along here. It's, uh, I don't know, it's six o'clock. <laughs> My clock must be way wrong. <laughs> <laughs> looked look like almost like nine to me or something. Well, anyway. So Paul is always, you'll notice this, Paul's always pushing. Paul's pushing. Paul's pushing the people of God. It's never status quo. It's never remaining where we're at. It is always movement. I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful for what happened tonight, a setup for the message in that sense that, that what was going on, this cadence that was coming out. The problem is we, we stopped moving somewhere, didn't we, Brad? Somewhere down the line, we got it into our minds. Well, it's all finished, and I'm, man, there's just nothing I can do anymore, and that would be a lie. <laughs> it is a finished work, but it needs to be fully entered into by us. It is the church And God sees it and calls it that as though it's in fullness, but it is not in fullness. And the apostles understood that and were continuously pushing them towards fullness. Can you understand that we're in a dance, brothers and sisters? Yes, God sees it as what he intended it to be, but it is not practically what it is intended to be. And all of us in this room, if we have... If, if we've been in church for any length of time, have been experiencing to some measure at least discontentedness within us. Amen? That can be a healthy thing. I know that, you know, this is what I'm saying about that. I know that this is not God's full intention. I know that his full testimony is not in this. I know that he does not have a people of his name. That, that is a marriage issue where she takes his name. That's the understanding of that passage. He does not have a people who are are clothed fully in his glory. In fact, just to be honest with you, so little of the glory of God has been among us that we don't even have an expectation for it anymore. I'm I'm not just saying that when we come to church, folks. If this thing is limited to a meeting, the ship sunk anyway. This isn't about some meeting. Church is not what you go to. Church is who we are. Whenever did church become a place? It has never been that in God's mind. It has always been a bride. But now we must speak, and I have to. I've been forced by the Holy Spirit to say some very difficult things to the body of Christ, and I have a choice in this, either cower or say it. Really, there's, it's, more, it's worse than that. <laughs> cower and get out behind the barn, get re-educated. <laughs> it's kind of like Laura. I'll show you who your daddy is. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it true, Larry? <laughs> I love the way the Lord works in that. I'll give you two options. Obey. Okay, I'm waiting for the second one. It never comes. <laughs> he just wants you to feel like you've got a choice. <laughs> he just wants us to have some sense of control. <laughs> No, that we're being forced to make a distinction between what the church in God's mind was meant to be and what it is. That's what's going on. It's what's having to be said 
by not just myself, all of us, even in dealing as we should be in dealing in the marketplace, in the business place, that's where most of us are assigned. That's 99% of us should be assigned there. Only a few. God can only handle a few idiots like me who are running around there. Isn't that true, Larry? I just thought I'd lighten things up here a little bit. No. No, the truth of the matter is we're being forced to make a distinction that was never the will of God, never the intention of God, never the plan of God, but it has always been in that sense a factor. Man's defections from God's plan. We see it with Adam and his wife. God's original purpose lay in those two. But was there disappointment? Was there failure? Did that was there the need of a recovery? We call that salvation. Back to the purpose. Yes. So God moves upon men, and, and God has in that time, he has an Enoch, and he has a Job, doesn't he? And he has an Abraham, and he has a Melchizedek. His men and women who had no Bible. There's no law. It wasn't needed. The law became a need because men wouldn't go to the Lord. That's the only reason it was needed. It was only and forever a tutor to get people back to the Lord. And some people got out of the law and back to the Lord. But you had to get out of the law to get to the Lord. I'm going to say that again. You had to get out of the law to get to the Lord. You still have to today in the Christian law to get to the Lord. David got out of the law because of his heart for God unto the Lord. You can read about it in the Psalms there where he sins a, a sin that uh, cannot be forgiven according to the law. He's guilty of blood guiltiness, and there's only one recompense for blood guiltiness. You were to be banished from the people and put to death. Should have been what happened to David. But David knew the Lord. And he understands something more than the law. Sacrifice and offering, you never did take pleasure in to begin with, God. All this law stuff was only pointing to a person forever. There has always been, there's a bloodline in this, spiritually speaking. There's always been men and women who come out of the religion of their day and get to the Lord. And here we are again. I just, how many can feel that in this room? How many are experiencing that? How many are experiencing in your communities, in your towns, in your cities? Terry, I, I hear it everywhere where I'm traveling. Uh, Terry, um, man, all the stuff that's going on, and this is going on, and this is going on, and, and people are saying, and I'm asking, where's the Lord in all of this? We've lost the one. So a church cannot be reckoned as church without the presence of the person. And I'm talking about within us now, not our meetings. Church is not a meeting. It's not a time. It's not a place. It's not a day. It's not a building. The church is a people. But a people gathered, not just saved, gathered in Christ. So anyway, Paul is constantly then up against it. Even as early as these epistles, Satan is doing his work. Well, as I was saying earlier, what we'll see then is the defection of Adam and his wife brings in a need. God's nature is that of, eternally, is that of a lamb. You know, lambs were created on this planet. To show the nature of God. A lamb can be easily overcome. I've got a friend who's a veterinarian over in West Virginia. Told me uh, one of the things they had to do. You're not going to like this, but I didn't like it when he said it. But one of the things they had to do, uh, Larry, you would know him. 
there in Summersville. One of the things I had to do to pass the, for the, the test to, to get to become the veterinarian was they had to uh, put a lamb to death. You tell me, he said, Terry, we, we had the lamb there and we, we slit its throat. He said it was the quietest thing I had ever seen of any death of any animal. He said it did not resist whatsoever. Our strong-mindedness, our self-will easily overcomes him in that sense, in resisting him. God does not rule by his power, though he could. It's just not his nature. He rules by laying himself down. That's his eternal nature, a lamb. He was slain because he was a lamb. He took the blow that was due to us. That was his nature. So as he said it to me this way one time, he said, I'm going to give myself for you, and there's nothing you can do to stop me. I love that about him, don't you? Well, let's uh, go to a few other passages of Scripture. So Paul here, in these passages are dealing with the mystery and has been a mystery. I'm afraid, though, that the mystery of Christ and the mystery of the purpose of the Father bound up with the person of his Son has become a mystery again in his house. That's my concern. I'm not saying it's 100% true at all because it isn't, but it's way too high of a percentage that we have failed to see what is the fullness of purpose. And we have given our hearts and given ourselves to things, but God's not a busybody who's doing many things. He's actually doing one thing that has components to it. We understand that, but it's one intention. And we can give ourselves to things without ever seeing his intention and his will. And it frustrates us. It's actually meant to frustrate us. We will never find our fulfillment in things. Now, when we look at the book of Genesis, and I'll look in chapter 2 just briefly, we actually see in chapter 2, in type, yes, but the eternal will of God portrayed in Genesis chapter 2. Just a few simple little verses here. I'll read it. Uh, Beginning uh, with verse number 18, Then the Lord God said, It is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Just underline that, a helper suitable. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the sky and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called a living creature, that was its name. And the man gave names to all the cattle, to the birds of the sky, and to every beast of the field, this, this last part, but for Adam there was not found a suitable helper or helper that was suitable for him. So the imagery here is of the man wanting or needing, as God's view, but a suitable helper. Verse 21, so the Lord God caused deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept. And then he took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. And the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib. We had some great ribs this afternoon, by the way. Just know what's... <laughs> Didn't we, Larry? It was really good. Fashioned into a woman the rib from the, from the, uh, the woman from the rib, which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. And for this cause, a man shall leave his father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. So the purpose then becomes, and I want to say this to us, the son of God coming out's purpose before the fall would be to possess a wife. 
Not physically, we understand that. I'm talking about spiritually. To possess a bride. And they shall, here's the entire reason why you're on this planet, become one flesh. You are here, I'm here, to become one with the one who has come out to possess us. This earth is a training ground. Don't forget that. And I want to hit this for just a second a little harder because it's important that we understand why our tests why our trials, why, are we are, why now we are here in battle. Battle would not have been necessary had there not been fall, a fall. Tests and trials would have absolutely been necessary in the making ready process of the bride. Knowing this, that we understand what, we're, what, we, have, what we have to understand is the bride, becoming the bride is a journey. It is not complete with the creation of the bride. It's not here in the scriptures. They must become one. She's already been created. She's already his wife, but they must become one. Can you say that with me? Become one. Therein lies the reason and the wisdom of God that this earth was chosen by God, that a anointed cherub named Lucifer was assigned to watch over this earth unto the purpose that lay with the lamb, a great eternal purpose that lay with the lamb and his bride. Lucifer had a high assignment in that sense of covering that purpose, that work of God. Did he fully understand it? No created being could. We know that the angels long to look in these things. I believe that about the cherubim, the seraphim. No created thing fully understands the mind of God or they would be greater than God himself. But nevertheless, it was a divine assignment of Lucifer's to cover the purpose of God. Lucifer's fall then is revealed to be that he would rather take the bride for himself and he goes right at the woman. Absolutely true. And in the spiritual sense, it is idolatry, and we would call it adultery. That's what actually is portrayed in the Old Testament. The Old Testament, you guys know this in your Bibles, the Old Testament portrays uh, spiritual adultery in the Old Testament as nothing less to be revealed than idolatry, going after other gods idols. Isn't that true? God calls that adultery and gave Israel a divorce certificate because she went after other gods. Isn't that right? God divorced. Anybody in this room divorced? Don't raise your hand. God divorced. He had a reason. He had cause for divorce. And, and I don't. I can't go any deeper. There's so much more in this, in the in what really happened, but which is a type that we have to see in this. When you really understand, and we have to understand, First uh, Corinthians chapter 15, we have to understand that Adam was a type. That man, Adam, was a type of the coming man. Is what Paul writes in First Corinthians chapter 15. He is a type of the first man, is a type of the second man, Christ. And I just want to say this, but I want to project for just a second the Lord himself into the situation. The woman has fallen, and there is a choice in this matter. The choice is forsake her or redeem her. Listen, I'm speaking of the Lord now. Guess what the Lord did? He partook of evil. He became it and conquered it. He did not forsake her. Well, did Adam know that? I don't think so. Adam knew a lot of things. I don't think he knew that. Adam was created in that sense. He was morally perfect, but he was spiritually ignorant. I'm not, I'm not demeaning him. 
I'm simply saying to you, God can't create spiritual maturity. It is grown. It is about, as the scripture says here, becoming one. Becoming. We are here to become. You face trials and you face tests because where there is great purpose, there's the necessity of great resistance. You want to know why you're being greatly resisted? Is because there's great purpose. Else, Satan wouldn't give you the time of day. It's really true. I hope this is freeing some of us. There are so many accusations against God in the church right now. Well, if he loved me, I, this wouldn't be going on in my life. The opposite is true. The fact is that because he loves us and there's his great purpose in this, his great purpose, an eternal purpose bound up in this, then we have a bullseye on our chest. That's why I can honestly say, truly say, the word of the Lord, if you've just come out of various trials and tests, the word of the Lord to you is another one is around the corner. We, we have to become okay with these things. Stop misinterpreting them to mean that God doesn't like me. What am I doing wrong? Lord, help. I don't understand. I don't. We have to understand that, that we are here to be tested by fire. Listen, before the fall, there was a serpent in the garden. You know why that serpent was in the garden? It was a part of the bride's preparation. Who did he come to? He came right to the bride. Reveals himself in that way to the bride. Part of the bride's preparation, listen, was learning to rule by being ruled from within. I want to say that to us again. Learning to rule, that is the destiny of the bride, to rule with the lamb. Learning to rule by being first ruled from within. An eternal kingdom, God's very nature and purpose established within us so that Satan would be defeated. The Lord calls the serpent. He didn't sneak into the garden. The Lord, where did the serpent go? <laughs> the Lord put him there, allowed him to go there. It's the same thing. Listen, well, did God know that they would fall? Yes, but his nature would not matter because his nature is his nature. And the fall of man cannot stop the eternal purpose of the Godhead. Man's failure won't stop the purpose. Listen, I'm just going to say this individually about myself, about us. My unwillingness to be conformed to the image of, the, of Christ does not stop that God's going to have a bride, with or without me. <laughs> I'll make the choice as to whether I want to be a part of the bride. And it is a choice. And listen, it was a choice before there was a need for salvation. I don't think um, that's been clearly brought out to our hearts enough. There was a choice to become one, to become the bride, before there was a need to make a choice to be saved. Why? Because God nature gives us a choice. There, there would not be a woman in this room that doesn't want to have a choice as to who you marry. Isn't that true? And God ultimately is going to have one who freely accepts his betrothal, his proposal. Amen. Isn't that true? So when we're dealing, as, as Paul is dealing with there in Ephesians, and we're going we're to get to this, the truth of the matter is what begins here in Genesis and the battle begins over the bride. I want us to see this. The battle surrounds the bride. The seed is going to come, Genesis 3.15, and the seed, which is the person of the Son of God, is going to crush the head of the serpent in his own timing. But right now, he is using the serpent to further prepare his bride. 
the Lord said some very clear things to me about this process when he was unveiling it to me over a series of encounters going before there ever was time and beyond time. Time's a very short space when viewed in light of eternity. But within the eternal mind of God, he was after a vessel that could be fully possessed of him, willingly. I mean that in the most beautiful way. You say, well, man, Terry, that's a strong word. I'm just quoting 1 Peter chapter 2, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people of his own possession. No, he wanted one, and she would have to make the choice to become one with him. So there it is. We see the failure of it, but then God reintroduces to us the dimension of purpose with his bride when he begins to speak about Israel. With me? Let me give you some passages of Scripture. We won't take time to look at all of them. There's too many. But Isaiah chapter 54, verse number 5. Isaiah 62, verse number 5. Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 14. Jeremiah chapter 31, we are going to look at. I want us to see this is a significant, all of them are, but very, very significant passage. Jeremiah 31, 31 and 32. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers in the day I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, although I was a, listen to this, a husband to them, declares the Lord. Now, here's what I want to say about that for just a second. Jeremiah's reference here is to Exodus 12 and the Passover. So here's what Jeremiah is saying to us about that Passover. That the Passover was a marriage covenant between the Lamb and the nation of Israel. What he's actually saying here. I became a husband to them. He's also saying that they broke their vows in that. Listen, folks, the the vow was simple. It was blood. Thus we, and I don't have time to bring them all in, but you'll know them anyway, all the scriptures. You're a bridegroom of blood to me. There it is, Exodus 12. What Israel perhaps didn't fully understand, some would, some wouldn't, and that's true of us right now. Some things I will understand, some things that won't come until later, or some things I may never understand right now. But nevertheless, what we must understand was only the lamb delivered the people out of Egypt. No miracle ever brought them out. They would not come out of Egypt until two things happened. They had to eat the lamb, and the proof of their eating of the lamb was the blood that the lamb had been slain, but that not only slain, they had to then eat. Jesus would say it this way, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you. Reference, direct reference to the Passover. At the final, listen, and I want to say this, at the commencement of Israel's marriage is the Passover, and the commencement of the church is the Passover. The night in which he was betrayed. And he took bread. He said, I've wanted to celebrate this Passover with you. I'll never celebrate it with you again in this way until the kingdom which was coming in his death, burial, and resurrection. Entirely other than way of the Passover, the Passover in its full intent was going to come forth It would move off the ground of Exodus 12 and onto the ground of the person of the lamb, not a natural lamb slain, but the true eternal lamb that every lamb on this earth was created to represent in the truest sense, if it's unblemished. Anyway, 
My purpose in saying that is it was a marriage covenant between God and his people. Exodus 12 was God called himself their husband. So God reintroduces after the failure with Adam and his wife, God reintroduces his purpose to his people again. And if you really want to see it, it's more than that. Let me, for instance, it's all throughout the scriptures. Uh, what I read there in Genesis chapter 2, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother. He'll leave her to go out to possess his wife. Now, let me just say, Genesis chapter 12, God speaks to Abraham, leave your father and leave your mother and come out to me. The revelation of God involved in that goes through a threefold process where God says to Abraham, I'm going to be seed. It's a direct reference. It is what I call the gospel of the seed, a direct reference to Genesis 3.15. The seed will crush the head of the serpent. God reveals the gospel of the seed to Abraham. But he must further define the gospel of the seed as a person, and he does just that, in his natural son, Isaac. So the seed is revealed then to be a son. It is not a gender issue, ladies. It is a direct reference to the son of God. So Abraham knows more than much of the church knows. Seed is a son, but that's not the final revelation. The final revelation, and it may be, as well be the book of Revelation, comes in Genesis chapter 22. When Isaac is carrying his own wood and they're taking the fire up the mountain and they get up the mountain and Isaac says, look, father, and Isaac's not some little child, he's a teenager. And Abraham's an old man, old man. And Isaac could have easily overpowered the old man. 